tonight <laughs> we have Sharon Reeve, who's here, and she's going to be giving us a presentation on the why we're losing bees and how we can save them. So please welcome Sharon Reeve. I love plants. And when I found out that I could have um, butterflies, bees, and birds in my garden because of what I plant, I was, I was done. I was, you know, that, that was the best for me. So that's how I garden now. Uh, everything is wildlife centered. And um, in the last maybe 10 years, I've gardened for bees, butterflies, um, hummingbirds, um, you know, the, those are my favorite things. Nothing thrills me more than to see uh, wildlife in my garden. So I'm gonna talk about uh, native bees today in particular and uh, why we're losing them and how to get them back. Okay, why is that progressing? Oh no. Oh, there. All right. Anyway, yay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this is sort of the uh, a rough outline uh, biodiversity in San Diego, overview of colony collapse disorder, um, how to identify a bee, because there's a lot of bee mimics out there. And then um, native plants or native bees as pollinators. <clears throat> and some special things about native bees, some like really interesting facts. And I, and I hope it's new to you because it's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, and then how to garden for bees, uh, what plants to pick um, and uh, what bees you might see in your garden. So let's start with a quiz. Of the 4,000 species of bees in the United States, how many species do you think there are in California? A, 150, B, 500, C, 1,000, or D, 1,500? D, you guys. Yeah, you're right. That's absolutely right. And it's um, absolutely amazing to me that we have so many species of bees in the state of California. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, and you probably already know this, um, San Diego is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Um, particularly the whole uh, contiguous U.S., we are the most biodiverse uh, place. It, we're considered a biodiversity hotspot. So not just bees, but all kinds of wildlife and plants occur here and nowhere else. Um, I'm sure you know this, this little guy here. Um, the state of California would cons consider this a fish. Do any of you guys know that? Know about that? Yeah, it's so funny. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess to to get uh, bees to be considered endangered, they had to classify them as a fish. I don't know if you've heard about that just recently, but uh, okay. So here's the honeybee, and did you know that the honeybee is not native to the U.S.? Okay, <laughs> it's native uh, to Europe, and uh, it came over here with the, some of the first settlers in 1622. And the reason it's so um, popular is because even though it's not the best pollinator, it's because it uh, nests in huge communal nests and um, honey, it has, you know, they make honey. Um, there are about, I think 30 species. See, I don't have my notes, so I'm gonna try to wing this, but uh, there are about 30 uh, species of honeybees with eight, eight subspecies, I, I believe. And um, out of the 20,000 species of bees in the whole world, only about 5% make honey. So colony collapse disorder, have you guys heard about that? Yes, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, I think. Um, anyway, what is it? What is causing it? Uh, in the early 2000s, um, Beekeepers started to notice that they would come out to their hives and the hives would be empty. There would just be a queen left. There would be no workers, no bodies, nothing. It would just be, you know, a clean, empty hive. And um, for some 
beekeepers who had, you know, thousands of hives, this was a really devastating thing. Sometimes as much as 50% of their hives would be gone, abandoned, and they didn't know, they didn't know why. There was lots of conjecture and theories and such. And, um, but what it, oh, here, I uh, wanted to talk about, this is sort of a typical meal um, in the US and just because pollinators are so important, 85% of the food that we eat is from pollination. And um, here is an example of a meal, uh, complements of pollinators. And then here's an example of what it would look like if we didn't have bees. And the reason the hamburger is so small and the cheese is because alfalfa is a main crop for, for feeding cattle and they would no longer be able to access that. So um, yes, because of all the theories and everything, um, they didn't know what was causing it, but only one thing really matched all of the data that was uh, coming out and that is uh, a class of chemicals started to be used called neonicotinoids. Have you heard of those? Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but it uh, very, very uh, accurately described the advent and increased use usage of these chemicals uh, um, and honey production started to go down at the same time. Especially what happened was um, they started to use neonicotinoids as a seed coating for mega crops like corn and soybeans. And this was uh, completely cataclysmic for bees and other wildlife. As a matter of fact, um, only one seed, like one, one little corn seed coated with neonicotinoids can kill a quarter of a million bees. And one seed can kill uh, a songbird. Um, so these are really bad chemicals. In fact, they are the most toxic pesticide that we've been able to come up with so far. Um, and uh, I have a, a scientist, and I can't remember his name, but he very accurately said, if I were to design a pesticide to kill bees, I couldn't have come up with anything better than in neonicotinoid, specifically imidacloprid, which is a, a, a chemical that's in a lot of the garden formulations. I think that's, oh, okay. So neonicotinoids, why are they so bad? They're very persistent for years, even after just one treatment. Um, direct contact can kill bees and low dosage exposure at parts per billion, like parts of parts per billion, you know, like a fraction of a parts per billion can um, impair bee flight, reproduction, navigation, and the ability to forage for food. I'm sure you've all seen the bees in your garden that are on the ground and they're wandering aimlessly. And, and that um, is a pretty good sign that, that, that they have had too much pesticide. Uh, the sublethal effects are cumulative um, because these things are so persistent in the environment. And uh, the seed treatment that they use for the, the huge crops, you know, thousands of millions of acres of corn and soy, um, only four to five percent of that chemical that's coated on the seed will actually become part of that plant. The rest of it 95% or so goes out into the environment, into the streams, into the soil, and um, it you know contaminates it. Um, there's been testing of our drinking water. It's in our drinking water. Uh, we don't know the health effects for humans um, because it's in our environment and in our food. Uh, they're not testing it. I'm I'm pretty sure if they did. Uh, you know, it's, it has neurological effects just like it does for bees. We're just, you know, a bigger, bigger organism. Um, the thing that's really, the thing that's shocking to me uh, about this group of uh, pesticides is that um, if you say you take a plant home and it's been treated and you put it in your garden, the pesticide in the plant uh, is, it's systemic. So it's all through the plant, it's in the leaves, um, it's in the nectar, it's in the uh, gutation drops, 
And so any organism that drinks from that plant, eats that plant uh, will be poisoned because the whole thing is poisoned. But what happens, and this is the part that just um, floors me, is that uh, the plant will release the pesticide into the soil because it, this just naturally happens. And if there are plants around, their root system also will take up this poison. So not just the plant that you put in, but the surrounding plants will become toxic as well. So uh, yeah. So um, yeah, and then um, James Fraser, a professor of entomology at Penn State, um, mentions that if you uh, combine pesticides, if you know, if you don't just use neonicotinoids, you use fungicides or glyphosate or whatever, um, the synergistic effect of that can be much more toxic. But there is hope. Um, we can all become um, stewards of our, our landscapes. Uh, we can make our landscapes a refuge for birds and bees. And, and I do this um, in my garden, um, not just the plants I pick, but also the, the habits that I have, I don't use pesticides. I've been an organic gardener for, I, you know, as long as I've been alive practically. I mean, not really, but, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, um, if, you plant, if you plant things appropriate for your climate and your soil and everything, you should not have problems with pests as, as, you know, as long as, you know, you keep your hands off. Um, I used to work in a, nursery that grew native plants for restoration work. And I just was, I marveled at how um, I'd see a salvia maybe that was attacked by aphids. And I knew that just within a day or two, I would see ladybugs, I would see surfid fly larva, I'd see um, uh, um, evidence of predatory wasps. I don't know if you've ever seen what a predatory wasp does, but they, they um, inject a uh, eggs into uh, aphids, live aphids, and um, they uh, hatch. And what's left is it's called an aphid mummy. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah. So um, yeah, so, you know, consider making your landscape a refuge for bees and birds. And, and think about it. I mean, if, if a lot of people did this, then, you know, before long, we, we, could, we could counteract some of the effects of, of the pesticide use. We would have a network. In fact, Doug Ptolemy called it homegrown national park. And I, I think that's just sweet, you know, um, you know, think about like maybe a quarter of the homes in your, your neighborhood uh, would garden this way, garden for um, pollinators, and uh, it could become a network. But uh, native bees are actually better pollinators. Uh, there's approximately 4,000 species in the US and they're more efficient pollinators uh, at least 100 times. They're active earlier in the year. Uh, they start around February where we live and they're, um, they continue. Uh, some, some species have uh, more than one um, uh, nest, you know, uh, sequential nests but some just are timed with uh, specific native plants. So I, I try to plant for uh, most of them, um, I, the generalists especially, and then also the ones that require uh, specialized plants. Um, so yeah, they're uh, active from around uh, February until through uh, October. Males also pollinate and uh, buzz pollination. I'll talk about that later. Do you guys know about that? Cool. <laughs> um, and um, also uh, native bees are resistant to mites, which is, has been a problem. They're finding that the neonicotinoids also are reducing the immune system response for bees and they become more suscept susceptible to the mites. Uh, yes, and they're able to fly in all kinds of inclement weather, which uh, honeybees cannot do. So how do you know it's a bee? Here, so here is a honeybee. Um, it has long, thin, elbowed antenna. The eyes are on the side of the head. It has four wings and it's furry. The, the hairs are actually branched at the tips. Uh, and so that is a, that's a bee. Those are some characteristics that are true to bees. 
So here's a fly. And you'll see that the, the eyes, because flies are predators, okay? The eyes are on the front of the head. Uh, most predators are like that. Uh, like for instance, take like a, a cow. The eyes are on the side of the head. A leopard or um, something like that, their eyes would be in the front. I'm, I'm not sure why, but I guess to see uh, what they're eating. <laughs> Um, so it doesn't have fur, it has uh, bristly hairs, uh, the eyes are in the front, the antenna are just two short antenna, and what else? I forget. And there was one other point, but I can't remember what it is. Uh, two wings, yeah, just two wings. They have little tiny other wings, but the two main wings. So uh, quiz, is this a bee or a fly? It's a fly. Yeah. Yeah, it's got the front eye. That was a, that's the big one, yeah. And then the two wings. It just has two wings. And there is very little tiny uh, antenna right there on the front. So yeah, it's a fly. But a lot, of, a lot of flies and some other insects mimic bees, of course, because bees can sting. And uh, it works out for them. This is actually in the genus of Volucella. It's a surfid fly. And they're awesome uh, things to have in the garden. I don't know if you've seen them around, but maybe not this particular one. But if you see little tiny striped fly like insects uh, around your plants and stuff, these are good guys. They, uh, they um, have larva that in, in the time that they are larva before they pupate, they can eat about 1200 aphids each. So uh, they're cool. So native bee sizes. I never really saw native bees before because I didn't know what they look like. And now that I know what they look like, their characteristics and such, I see them all over the place. But they really vary in size and shape. Um, just to give you an indication, uh, the largest bee that we have in California is um, a carpenter bee. This one is a female Xylocopa veripuncta. And then the smallest one is a Perdita minima. And that Perdita minima is only a couple of millimeters long. So a lot of the, the native bees are small and they fly really fast. Uh, they don't fly like a, a honey bee. They fly more like a fly because they're, they're really fast and they're really focused on provisioning their nest with uh, pollen. Also, uh, this is a really good photo for this, but bees have five eyes. They have the two compound eyes, and then on the top of the head, you can see this here. There's three, three uh, very simple eyes, and uh, those are called ocelli. And they help the bee uh, differentiate between light and dark, and also to see whether uh, predators are coming at the, the, they react much faster to these uh, simple eyes with you know, uh, differing light levels. And so it, it allows them to escape predation. So uh, pollination is basically a happy accident. Um, bees go from flower to flower and um, some of the pollen, collecting pollen, and then some of that pollen might accidentally fall into the stigma of the, the next plant. And so uh, pollination occurs. Bees and, and, and um, flowers actually have, you know, way different agendas. You know, bees want all the pollen and the plant wants all the pollen to go to pollinate. So they, there's a little happy medium that goes on. The bees get a lot of pollina uh, pollen and then the flowers get some pollination. Maybe not as much as they want individually, but they, you know, it happens. So yeah, so uh, yeah, the pollen moves. Um, there's a, a thing, a concept called floral consistency. And um, what happens is the female bee, she's, she's born, she pupates, she's ready to go. Males are usually waiting to mate with her right away. And uh, she has to make a nest. She has to lay eggs. She has to provision that nest with pollen from plants. Nectar for a lot of these native bees is just an ener energy source for the adults. And it really doesn't have anything to do with the, the nesting. The pollen is for nutrition of the, the, the babies, the larva. 
So um, floral consistency is when uh, bees tend to focus on one type of, of flower at each time. So they're not gonna do you know, a lupin and then a, a poppy. They're gonna do the same sorts of flowers and um, uh, on each trip. And then it, when the pollen gets low on those same kinds of flowers, then they'll switch to another flower. It's called floral consistency. Okay, and then bees carry pollen in different places. I, I don't know if you knew, if you guys knew that, but um, you know we're used to seeing the hind legs uh, the, um, of the honeybee. But then there's also um, a serotina, uh, which is a um, related to a carpenter bee, and they carry the pollen on, on the underside of their abdomen. And the cool thing is. Um, they don't have to work that hard to gather the pollen. Uh, bumblebees are positively charged and the pollen is negatively charged and it basically jumps on them when they land, land on flowers. But they can do this thing. A lot of the native bees, not all of them, but a lot of the native bees uh, can do this thing called buzz pollination. And that is, it's, it's so cool. Um, Okay, about, I think it was 9% of plants have their pollen hidden. For example, the, in the family Solanaceae, the, the pollen is in poricidal anthers, it's, it's hidden. And um, what the bee can do, and um, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, what the bee can do, they grasp the flower, the muscles that control their wings for flying, they disengage the muscle and they vibrate them. And it, so this, you'll hear a, you know, a buzz. And then when they get to a flower and they do the buzz pollination, you'll hear, eh, you know, it's, it's like a higher pitched buzz, a little like frantic. And, um, and when they do that and they get to a certain frequency, the, the pollen will just dump onto the bee. And that's buzz pollination. And um, it's really cool. And they can get so much more pollen when they use this uh, strategy. S and then some bees have long tongues and then some bees have short tongues. The ones that can't buzz pollinate and that have short tongues, they can go to uh, like, it, you can see right here in the Arctostaphylis, um, the bee has chewed a hole into the side of the flower so that it can avoid having to buzz pollinate and um, it can reach the nectar and pollen without uh, doing any work. So um, I want you to look at your Arctostaphylis, you know, flowers next year and you'll, you'll see this. It's uh, pretty incredible. Um, the, a lot, of, oh, I'll talk about this again. <laughs> okay, so uh, trap lining. I just thought this was awesome. Um, it's called either trap lining or um, trap line foraging. Okay, so imagine this. So a female bee, she's born, she, she doesn't know what she's doing. She just starts visiting flowers, right? And she quickly determines which flowers have the most bang for the buck, the most pollen uh, outlo uh, output. And then she, I mean... <sighs> This is just a little insect. They figure out the most efficient way. They go maybe, you know, A, B, C, D, as far as the flower's visitation goes, but then they just say, you know, that's not efficient. It's more efficient if I go B, C, D, A. And that's what they do. They, they figure out what plants have the most pollen and the most efficient way to get back to their nest. That's cool. Nectar guides, do you guys, I mean, bees can see in ultraviolet and flowers have nectar guides, ultraviolet markings that we can't see that direct them to where the floral reward is, where the nectar and pollen is. Um, like this yellow flower up here, that's how we see it. And then um, that's how the bees see it. So it's like, um, uh, you know, uh, here, <laughs> this, is, this is where you should, you should go. Uh, I, th I think that's pretty cool. Um, okay, oh yeah, yeah. So if you are gardening for bees, it's really important that you have some bare earth that you can leave in a sunny spot. They especially like sandy soil. Um, I've never noticed ground nesting bees at my place, but um, 
I hope they're there. Uh, I know I have a lot of native bees, so they're nesting somewhere. I just, I just don't know. But 70% of bees nest in the ground and many other species um, nest in dead plant stems like of berries, rubus, and other pithy stems that are hollow in the inside. They nest in them at, um, when they're dead. Not the bees, the, <laughs> the plant. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, oh. Oh yeah, right. Okay, so let's talk about some bees that we might see in the garden uh, in San Diego. So Xylopunct uh, Xylocopa veripuncta female, the big shiny carpenter bees, you see those uh, a lot. And they nest in the dead stems of Hespero yucca. So that's really cool. I, and I planted this plant just, just for that. Um, and then here is the, the miniature carpenter bee, the megachile. It's a leaf cutter bee. And these are really small. Uh, they, if you see plant leaves that have circular cutout, cutouts and they are really perfect circles, then it might be the work of the, the leaf cutter bee. One of the plants they use a lot, and so it made me plant the plant because I want them to have their leaves to cut, uh, is a red bud, uh, Circus occidentalis, the native one. You'll see a lot of times the circular holes in those. I've also noticed them doing this to roses. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but this is the male Xylocopa veripuncta. Um, it is sexually dimorphic. So here it is, it looks entirely different than the female. They call this a teddy bear bee. And I've only seen a handful of these in my garden. Um, they, don't, they don't last very long. Uh, they're very, um, you notice them, you can see them. They have, they, they have a territory and their whole job in life is to, to fly around the territory and to mate with females if they can find them. And in the process, they put out a pheromone that has a fruity smell. I've never been able to detect the smell, but I've, I've heard it's really pleasant. And uh, yeah, these guys, they don't sting, so they, you can grab them if you want, you know. So, uh, so sort of, I'm gonna talk about bumblebees in sequence. I mean, I see bumblebees in my garden because they're just bigger and I, I recognize them, but Bombus fosnesenski, Vasnesenskii, our yellow face bee, is, um, is a bee you'll see all over the place. But this bee is a little bit different. It, it does also communally nest. And so you'll see different sizes of them. You'll see uh, a big, big uh, one about, I don't know, about an inch or so uh, long. And then you'll see little smaller ones. And those are the, the drones and the workers. Uh, and so here's a Bombus fosnesenskii on uh, Erigeron glaucus, which is a great uh, bee plant. And then Bombus, this is a little later in the, in the year, Bombus melanopygus, this guy is even smaller and he's really furry and cute. And um, I, uh, I don't usually have non-native plants, but sometimes I have an echium in my garden just for them, they love, they love echium and um, what's the other? I'll, I'll think of it in just a second. Uh, and then, of course, you can't go wrong with uh, uh, buckwheat. All the buckwheats are fantastic. But this is bomb Bombus caliginosus on uh, Ariogonum um, fasciculatum. Oh. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> There was also a serotina on there and I, I forgot to point it out. Um, Bombus sonoris. Now this guy needs um, really specific environmental conditions, I, I think, because some years you'll see them, a lot of them, and then some years you won't. They tend to use uh, Bombus vosnesenskii burrows uh, to nest in after the Bombus. You'll see them in the summertime. So. The reason I have some plants that are not native is because they tend to bloom in the summertime when it, nothing's blooming. My, my whole goal is to have something blooming um, all year around. 
and then um, on mallow, so that, that would be uh, malacathamnus, uh, spheralcia, other kind of mallow plants, uh, you'll see diadasia. They're really cute little bees. The males tend to sleep in the flowers just to wait for the females in the morning. Um, they hold hands. They have these look kind of curly hands and they hold hands in the flowers and they're very cute. Uh, they call them turret bees as well. They nest in the ground and they make little turrets uh, above the entry hole for the nest. This is from my friend, Chris Ethington. Um, she, she got this picture. It looks like he's waving or she's waving. Uh, so Agapostomum texensis, this is the female. This is another sexually dimorphic bee on Grindelia. All the Grindelias are excellent bee plants. Uh, this is the male. It's got the striped abdomen. Uh, and then if you have squash at all, I mean, whether you have uh, squash from the garden center or a native squash, like uh, what fetidisma, um, you'll see uh, this this squash bee, uh, Pepinapus prunosa. Um, they're very very fast flyers. You won't realize that they're a bee because of the way they fly. They fly like flies, and uh, you'll see if you come out early in the morning, you'll see the males again in the in the flowers. So this is Ceratina species on Areogonum, and. Um, just to give you an idea how small some of these bees are, this is a female Lazia glossum on a cactus, and I never would have, a cactus flower, I never would have seen it if, if it hadn't been such a stark uh, contrast. Is this bee is tiny, you know, a couple, couple of millimeters. So how to make native, native bees happy? Plant native plants primarily. Uh, large groups of plants throughout the year. They need at least a meter square to make it worth their while. Um, if you want to plant the very, very best bee plant, plant a native oak. Um, they're absolutely, when the oaks are blooming, it's just almost deafening. Um, it's so beautiful. Uh, be a messy gardener, leave some of those stems for the stem nesting bees. Provide water and bare earth, garden organically. And then uh, they especially like flowers in white, blue, and yellow, but I still also see them on uh, red flowers like um, callus, uh, callus, callus stem. What is the native bottle brush? I forget, calla something. <laughs> anyway, I see them, I'm, tons of them on that, on that plant. Okay, so this is what we want to get away from sort of the typical American garden with hardly any flowering plants and plants from everywhere but but uh, where we live. This is more like what we we want to see. This is a photo from Theodore Payne. But oh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so to take you through the year kind of like what kind of plants are really good for bees. Uh, Arctostaphylus are all great for bees. Um, and if you pick the varieties selections right, you'll have something blooming for a few months. This is Arctostaphylus pungent. It's one of my favorite, favorite ones. Uh, all the lupins are fantastic. Uh, and there's all kinds of lupins. And then there's something like a lupin would be an acme spawn. That's another really good plant for bees. A lot of the lupins you can start from seed. They're super easy to start from seed. And if you just have a small area and you have just maybe like some pots, right? You can have a bee garden. Um, California poppies, lupins, clarkia, uh, native sunflowers. Um, you can have something blooming for most all the year, even on say like a deck or something like that. So if that's my advice. If you want to get started and you don't have much room, plant in pots, do some seeds of some native wildflowers and you'll, you'll be great. So Circus occidentalis, I talked about that before. When it's blooming, it's just covered in bees and uh, they, the leaf cutter bees also like the, the leaves for this plant. All the little uh, leaved and I mean little flowered salvias are fantastic for bees and also hummingbirds, of course. Um, this is salvia daris choice, salvia mellifera, salvia cambrioides, 
uh, salvia sonamensis, they're all good. And once again, you can get things that are blooming for many months. Uh, salvia pozo blue is, is a cross, a Cleveland sage cross that is just phenomenal. If you keep watering it, it just keeps blooming. Uh, and then all the cenothus, you guys all know that. I don't, I don't think this photo was tampered with. It's cenothus dark star. But once again, you can get cenothus that bloom uh, for, for, for a while, sequential bloom. And I mean, what's better than a mass of flowers? I mean, you're going to have bees. Cenothus Ray Hartman, of course, that's a great plant. And here is another Cenothus Ray Hartman. And I, I picked this photo to illustrate layers. So, um, you know, it's one thing to have wildflowers, but if you garden in layers, you garden, think vertically, um, you can have a, a, a limbed up Cenothus with, you know, uh, um, lupins and, and other things at the base. And say there's also a native oak in this yard or a sycamore. I mean, this is, you know, you're starting to make some really good habitat. Um, coffee berry is awesome, Frangula californica. They have little, little tiny flowers, but man, it's just uh, full of bees. Verbena lilacina, a fantastic plant, um, and so are poppies. Uh, I, I, you should, if you haven't, um, plant poppies and uh, observe the bees when they go into the flowers. They just, they're ecstatic the way they collect the pollen, you know? Um, so Verbena lilacina is, is a really excellent native plant because it tends to have a nice shape without pruning. It blooms for uh, most all the year. Okay, and all the phacelias, echiums, phacelias, all really great bee plants. Uh, here's, uh, you can see these two as well, Facelia campanularia and California poppies, a really great long blooming combination that bees love. So you have Bombus fostisenskii on Echium, Bombus melan melanopygus on Facelia. This uh, was a native Facelia I saw in Pomona, there was a bunch of this and it was just humming with bees. Heteromyles is a super duper plant. When it's blooming, it's just got tons of bees on it. And, you know, if the ultimate drought tolerant plant, you get this plant established, water it a couple times, and you don't ever have to water it again. It always looks refreshingly green and beautiful. And Romnia culteri, that's a great plant. Um, I've only seen honeybees on that, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everybody else likes it too. And Calolophus, this is not a native, it's from Texas, but it's very popular. And I, I do have this plant because it blooms in the summertime when not a lot of natives are. And Dendermo, Dendermicon harfordii is a fantastic plant uh, pop in the poppy family. And so it's very popular with bees and it blooms pretty much 365. I mean, it really does. Luc Leucophyllum is another plant that I put in my garden that's not native, but it's a great plant. It's called a Texas barometer plant. It's from Texas and it has a tendency to bloom all summer as long as you water it every once in a while. So, and the carpenter bees and uh, the other bigger bumblebees just really love this plant. So I have it in my garden. Uh, Palo Verde Desert Museum, as you can see the carpenter bee on that. It's just crazy with bees. Uh, and nothing makes me happier, you know, to go out in my garden and see lots of bees or lots of birds or all of the above. And if you plant it, they will come. They just do. It's just amazing to me how it works. You know how you put a milkweed in your garden and before you know it, you have monarch butterflies. And I'm, I'm, I'm sold on that. Uh, Chilapsis linearis. This one's Bubba. It's, a, it's kind of sterile cultivar. I've never seen any actual seeds. But um, carbon bees love this, uh, hummingbirds love this, and it's super fragrant and wonderful. And it blooms for a long time, as long as you water it once in a while. Uh, Melasma lorina, uh, a lot of times these flowers are really high and you can't see them, but they're very popular with the small bees, the lazia glossum and the perdita. Vi Vitex agnus castus, once again, it's not a native, but very popular with the bees, very drought tolerant. And I have, and it blooms in the summer, so I have this in my garden. 
Uh, all the buckwheats are awesome. Eriogonum fasciculatum, giganteum is, you know, just a buffet for pollinators. It's a wonderful plant. Um, and then I want to just mention, you could have a long season of bloom with composite flowers. Um, bees like composite flowers. Uh, you know, things like Grandelia. Here's Encelia. It starts with Encelia. Encelia blooms for a long time. I still have some blooming in my garden. Here it is, June. Um, then you can also plant Bahiopsis. It blooms a little bit later for a long time. And then if in the summertime you, you put some um, sunflower, uh, native sunflowers like this Helianthus anise, or you can also plant uh, sunflowers you just have to make sure that they haven't bred out the pollen because some sunflowers have no pollen now i don't i'm i don't know why <laughs> but um mammoth is one that has pollen and so is lemon queen and so if you don't have native sunflowers you can still uh, benefit the bees so i have two blogs one is natives now socal another one is life goes better with plants uh, how we can help, uh, write, write letters. Um, you could contact uh, your local county and make sure that they're using, that they're not using nicotinoids in the parks. Um, uh, I, I bug the garden centers. I, I don't buy plants unless I absolutely know that they haven't been treated with, with pesticides. Uh, I know I have a list of places, uh, nurseries that don't use neonicotinoids. I'll, I'll give you a couple off the top of my head. If you want, I can give you a longer list later. Um, Musa Creek, they're awesome. Uh, Annie's Annuals, Recon West, uh, Native Sons, Monterey Bay, Gourmet Grown, uh, Sea Star Nursery. Um, there are a few nurseries that's, oh, Monrovia stopped using them five years ago. Um, there are a few nurseries like at Walter Anderson's that still use neonicotinoids and uh, I don't buy those plants. Uh, I've talked to them a bunch of times, but they still have them. So plant flowers attractive to bees in large areas, uh, at least a meter square, white flowers, yellow flowers, small tubed, uh, purple flowers like salvias, those are the most attractive uh, plants for the bees. Um, plant, plan for multi-season bloom and don't use pesticides. Long live the bees. <laughs> right. So questions? Sure. Oh, Tythonia. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, I haven't noticed a. I have a, have it also. I haven't noticed a right of bees, but it does it does feed some pollinators. So you know, I have it. I mean, as long as you have it, about seventy percent of your plants is native. You can go, you know, a little bit wild. <laughs> And have some some different plants, yeah. But I'm sure that they utilize that. I mean, it's a, a sunflower type, a composite yes. flower. I see on the screen how long do neonicotinoids last? Yeah, many many years, many years. Yeah, and they break down. So, um, in our soils, we have semi-arid soils. They last a long time. Yeah, uh, they need water kind of to break down, and we don't get much, you know, and. Um, uh, let's see what else. So I, I don't know specifics, but I know it is, it's many years. And then they, when they break down, those products are also toxic. So, I mean, it's not, it, it so it takes a while. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Do I have a plant list for bees like? Um, yeah, no, but I can make one. And we'll put it in the newsletter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure.
Oh, okay, that's, that's an excellent question. No, they don't normally know. They don't normally know at all. Okay, I'll say the question. Okay, how do you know when you go to the garden center whether a nursery has used neonicotinoids or not on a plant? That's a good question. Um, I, I, part of, the, part of the, the thing about that is that what you do is you go to any of the garden center employees and you ask them, you say, do you use neonicotinoids on this plant? And they will invariably say, what's that? But it's an education, you know? So I look at, at going to the garden center as a, as, as a way to educate um, people on these chemicals. And uh, so they don't normally know, but then I, I look on the plant and it will say usually on there, what nurse who grew the plant? And I will go to the front desk and I'll say, uh, do you have a number for them? Or I'll look up the, the number myself, you know, um, and I call them and ask them. Um, there's some, <laughs> there's some uh, nurseries now that won't answer the phone or they won't, you can't contact them. Like um, Smart Planet, you've heard of those plants at Home Depot, right? Um, I have, I have tried to contact them in the last few months, probably 10 times, and they will not return my, my calls or my emails. So, you know, you do what you can. Yeah. Yes, yes, they do. A neonic spread through the soil to other, to other plants, and they make the plants toxic to all kinds of insects, all the insects. Yeah. Oh, okay. It says here, it's, oh, that's Donna Malin. <laughs> Neonics must spread to other bees and beneficial insects through the soil leaves, etc. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Do you have a, like, list of nurseries that Oh, good, good question. No, Monrovia does not. Yeah, the only, the only, the only, uh, okay, I should repeat it, right? Okay, do I know of nurseries that use neonicotinoids? Yes, I do. Uh, specifically one that I know that does, and that's Palomar Mesa Growers. And I've called them, I've emailed them, I've Facebooked them, I've Instagrammed them. They don't care. The problem is they grow pollinator plants, and it breaks my heart because people will in good faith buy these plants, put them in their garden and poison wildlife. So. Oh no. Oh, cool. Okay, um, just a comment, I guess. Um, this person had carpenter bees in an avocado stump for 10 years and, uh, okay. This last winter had a huge population of black female and yellow teddy bears. Love the colony. This March, the teddy bears started dying around the stump, and now it appears the entire nest is gone or dead. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I hope they come back. I mean, it has been really dry. I don't know how, if that has anything to do with it. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's not on my website, but I can send them to, to care. Yeah. Thank you.